It's story time. Chapter 3 The Other Side In the ninth episode of season one, my guest Ying mentions a woman named June Ahern. Uh, so my name is June Ahern, and uh, I am mostly retired, but for over 45 years, I had a really quite successful uh, profession as a psychic reader and medium, uh, life coach, and author of four books. After a near death experience, June began her journey as a medium. Apologies for the occasional dip in quality during the call. It's been really a wonderful, surprising career that I got into. It was a surprise to me. I wasn't something that I said I was going to do when I grow up at all. You know, I came from kind of the uh, old kind of tradition where girls didn't go to college and because they were just going to get married. So I was told to take typing and shorthand so I could get a job long enough to meet a husband. And I, I just knew that wasn't right for me. The first day I went in San Francisco, I went downtown on the bus and I looked at all those people and I said to myself, this isn't going to work out. Then I found a school for long distance truck driving and I decided that would be the job for me. I, I'd like to get out of town, be on the road, be by myself. And that's what I w signed up at the school. I called and made all the arrangements. And then I had an auto accident, and that's what changed my whole life and the whole path and everything else that was laid out for me from that day on. Uh, the, one of the curious things about being in the accident is that when I was sitting in the car, we had a utility pole head on, and this is before seat belts. Um, I, I had I disfigured my face. Um, the I went through the windshield, and when I came back in, the windshield came back in on my face. There was a woman that was outside the car and she was looking in and she had this beautiful, dressed all in white and warm and she's looking at me. And I thought she said to me, it's going to be okay. Afterwards, the policeman that showed up and he was sitting there talking to me. And uh, you know, later on when I, he, he called me to get the report and I said, well, the, that woman told me it was gonna be okay. He said, what woman? We had been lost in a, you know, like a, a complex, a parking lot uh, down by Stanford. And he says, uh, the couple that saw the accident, they left and used phone booth, you know, right? You had to find a phone, a phone booth. And they didn't come back. We came. Uh, so there was nobody else there. And I know that woman was there. And, and I believe she must have been an angel to me. I believe it because she sent me the feeling of calm down. It will come down, you can be okay. Wherever the other side is, whether it's heaven, nirvana, or another dimension, uh, it certainly felt like utopia. Uh, it was blissful. It was so beautiful. Honestly, I didn't want to come back. I, I wanted to stay there. Even with all the years of meditation and having joyful, peaceful times, nothing, nothing was ever like that feeling. When I went to the other side, I did not go through a tunnel like other people. I saw myself out in nature and there was relatives that I didn't know. We, when we came to this country, uh, we were the only family that came. We didn't come with other relatives. So most of my knowing relatives was by photographs. And these were relatives that had passed on before and they were in this garden. All I knew is there were all these relatives and grandparents and aunts and uncles. And they were all having this beautiful time. They were laughing and joyful. And it was bright, not bright to where it hurt your eyes, but such a brightness that it was warm and inviting. And there was a gate in front of me. And I remember my grandparents looking at me. They said, hello, June. How, how are you? And you know, greeting, a very nice, and everyone's laughing and looking and greeting. And I wanted to come in. I went up and said, I, you know, I want to come in. And they said, not now, June, not now. And waved me, actually waved me away. That's why I said I always got rejected at the pearly gates and just waved me away. 
And I remember feeling extremely disappointed that I was not there. And when I returned, you know, I was in the emergency ward. They were cutting off my clothes and poking in needles in my face and all kinds of stuff was going on. And I, I didn't want to be back in life. I couldn't talk about it for years afterwards. I mean, how are you going to tell anybody? Guess what? I died in case. I, I saw the other side, you know. I went to heaven and they rejected me. So I couldn't talk about it. It wasn't until someone gave me, uh, Dr. Raymond Moody, who wrote uh, Life After Life, that reading of the accounts of the research he had done, I finally, it was early 80s that I came out and said to somebody, you know what? I, I had one of these things called near-death experience. It isn't common. Like now, it's very common. Uh, you can find meetings all over. People are speaking about it openly. Back then, people weren't talking about that kind of thing. It was thought to be, again, taboo or not scientific enough. It was, it was you know, really controversial. Before my accident, a few months before, I had gone to a friend's friend's house that was doing readings of the playing cards. You know, just a little party with all the girls. You know, I was only 19. And I went because I was very curious. And she has said, you're going to have a really bad accident, like a car accident. And there are going to be two men there. And you have to decide uh, what man you want. And I went, oh, my God, that sounds terrible. I'm not going to have a reading again. Uh, and then because she had been so accurate within three or four months, this accident, I went and looked for how do, how do I learn to do this? So I bought a book called It's in the Cards. And that was about, what, 1970? And I thought, well, I'm going to learn how to read these so I can find out. So it was curiosity that drove me. How did this happen? You know, my mother used to read our tea leaves in the morning, and we'd all get a little laugh out of it, you know. Nobody really took it real serious, and she watched a program called One Step Beyond. She was kind of into it, but we grew up in a very religious family, so you weren't allowed to talk about that to the nuns, you know, to the priests, to anybody outside that mom read tea leaves. And it was you know, forbidden within our, our religion. So I started studying the cards and I had already been, I knew that sometimes you could look at something and get information. And I started being correct for people. People, I had to practice. So I called, uh, you know, I have five sisters and two brothers and I, I just had everybody let me do a reading for them. And they were like, yeah, that's right. Or that happened. So, <coughs> excuse me, because I came curious, I went to, I, I learned that there were cards called the Tarot. Never seen them before, didn't know anything about them. And in San Francisco at that time, you know, the learning annex, I don't know if it's still in existence. It would give all kinds of classes and have all kinds of speakers all over. And before that, there was a school called Orpheum. So I went to this class of Tarot. One of the classes, the teacher asked me to stay and said to me, you know, you're really gifted at this you should really think about doing it. And I still didn't get it, you know? And I started doing, taking the tarot cards and reading for everybody I met, all my friends, all their friends, buses, cocktail lounges. I just wanted to keep reading for people. And finally in 1975, a friend of mine said, I have three people that want a reading. And it, to me, now it's a hobby. I'm studying, I'm studying all the time. I'm I got my cards by my pillow. I sleep with them. I just kind of fell in love with the tarot. And so I took my first clients in San Francisco, in Noe Valley, for $5 a reading. And I was like, wow. I had quite extensive injuries on my face and, and part of my leg. And so I kind of gave up the idea of long distance driving. So I was back working in an office. And the tarot cards are meaning for people saved me from being gloomy, being depressed. And that's how it was. It just kept growing. And then people of other friends heard about me and they wanted to come. And I never advertised for doing readings and I ended up being busy all the time. It, it, as a young woman in a disfigured face, all of a sudden, my whole world was about recovery, uh, getting used to having scars on my face getting you know my body back in shape i mean i was in the hospital a week uh, pretty much unheard of uh, <laughs> these days but uh you know i was in a bad shape i had glass all in my eye they had my eye covered they were convinced that i was probably going to be blind that's what they told my parents uh, i wasn't blind and uh, you know i had one of the best plastic surgeons that was leaving the emergency room when i was coming in 
and he came in. He says, "I knew you're gonna you're gonna need me." So uh, I, I was all in recovery. I did not even think about fate at all. Years later, I went into trance for someone to ask me questions, and one of the questions is, "Why me?" And I thought. <laughs> I thought they were going to say, oh, because you were so spiritual, you know, you were destined to spirituality. What the answer came is, you were available. So perhaps, um, you know, there's times for people to come back and the, the message of love, compassion, and kindness, and all of the things that we read about and some of us practice, uh, hopefully practice, uh, perhaps then I was just available to come back and do this work. You know, and uh, so it was after my car accident and a near-death experience that I actually clinically died and then came back. This is not the first time I've heard of someone having a near-death experience and then returning to life spiritually changed. It's almost as if something is unlocked within you. So what do these experiences tell us about the transition from life to death? about the nature of existence and consciousness. Is it really proof of an afterlife, as many people believe? Or is there a scientific explanation? The common factors of near-death experiences are feeling a sense of calm, feeling disassociated from your body, and feeling the presence of other people or entities. And these feelings are also found in those who ingest dimethyltryptamine, more commonly known as DMT. So numerous studies have been done to compare the effects of DMT and the stories of those who have had near-death experiences, and there is a striking resemblance. However, they're not entirely identical. A subtle yet important distinction is that those who ingested DMT had feelings of entering an unearthly realm while those having a near-death experience had feelings of coming to a point of no return. Even if these near-death experiences are simply our body's physical way of coping with the stress of almost dying, how beautiful is it that our bodies have this built-in function that cares for us so deeply, that, by design, we are built to handle the transition from life to death. Having trust in your body and truly connecting with it is one of the first steps you can take to opening up your intuition. We're all psychic. You have to op you can open up that part of your brain. You can start out with three, five minutes a day. I'm going to just calm my mind, calm my breathing, and feel, become very much aware of my body, what I'm feeling. Yoga is really good. Hatha yoga, body yoga uh, is very good for beginning process of removing stress from the body in order to access the psychic mind. Most people have some kind of psychic experience and it could be as simple as saying to somebody, I knew I was going to run into you. It is so simple that people miss their psychic mind working, you know, and that's what they call following your heart, following your feelings, uh, intuition. And so the psychic mind, once you open up to the intuition and start to trust it, and you can do fun things, like you can play. Um, when we were kids, we would turn the cards over and mess them up, and then we would try to, to remember, you know, which ones matched, where was the other spade, or where was the other diamond, or like that. So you keep your mind active, and you begin to do that. And you can play with, I'm going to send you a message. You can say to your husband, okay, or, or whoever you want to play with, uh, I'm going to think of something, someplace. I always say, think of someplace you really love to go to. And, and think about, you know, stop and see it and smell it and hear it and all the things. And then the other person gives you back, well, I feel like you're thinking of this wherever it is, you know, this house you used to go to as a kid. And I see this older woman, maybe you're visiting your grandmother, things like that. Uh, so these kind of things prompt you. They prompt the psychic mind to begin to work. Uh, ESP, telepathy is the best way. When I would teach classes, I would have all kinds of games we would play. Hold objects, telekinesis, you know, hold an object, what do you feel about it? And then we would check with the other person that brought it, the other student. So once you open it up and you begin to feel, wow, I can do this or I get this, then you don't really mistrust yourself as much. 
I think it's good to have a, a, a healthy skepticism, like a scientist. A scientist will say, I don't know if this is real, but I'm going to go ahead and experiment with it. I'm going to look at it, listen to what others are saying. Uh, you have not had this experience, you say to yourself, but let me hear you. And again, then do I want to believe? Do I want to open up and, and see, play the psychic game? Um, you know, I could do it with cards. I can, uh, there's, there's cards called the Zener deck that has certain symbols on it, stars and diamonds, and, and you can play that game. And you can test it out for yourself. I mean, I think people should test it out for themselves. I don't, hey, I don't believe every psychic ever any, or who says they're a psychic. And while this place is haunted, I'm like, yeah, let me see for myself. I'm pretty skeptical. You can't change anybody's mind. And it's a waste of breath to change, try to change somebody's mind that already has uh, you know, ideas that this can't happen. They've never experienced it. Once I heard the pet psychic say to John Edwards, when he said, why don't people believe in this? And she said, well, darling, um, if you haven't experienced it, you just really don't know. And that's what it comes to when people say things to me like, I don't believe in that. And I say, well, that's my life. You know, I've seen it. I've been there. And uh, tell me something about myself. I don't play that game. If they have a closed mind, they only want to argue with you their thoughts, and they're not going to entertain what you have to say. There are other people that are interested, and then they start talking about, well, you know, that's kind of funny you said that because I knew this about this person or this event. I had a dream. Don't keep running to psychics for the answer. I, uh, readers, I'm, I'm not for that at all. The reader should really teach you how to make decisions based upon trusting yourself. It's what I did for years. And that's what I'd like to say, you know. It's part of life. It's part of who you are. But just don't follow what somebody else tells you. Check it out for yourself. If you'd like to learn more about June's work, you can visit her website in the show notes at juneahern.com. Consider grabbing yourself a copy of her most popular book, How to Talk with Spirits. 